Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales. And uh, in this uh, lecture on the history of mathematics, we're gonna have a look at group theory, in particular simple groups and Lie groups and the search for symmetry. So group theory, as we've seen before, was born really uh, from number theory. and the theory of equations. Sort of culminating in, uh, in Galois, a theory which really brought it uh, to life. But in the 19th century, uh, this was enlarged and people started to realize that group theory actually extended in a lot of different directions. So in the sort of second half of the 19th century, uh, group theory developed and uh, we sort of had this idea that uh, groups control symmetries and associated geometries. So there was a really uh, splendid blossoming of group theoretical thinking. And some of the key figures here were French mathematician Camille Jordan, who you may know from Jordan canonical form, whose uh, dates are 1838 to 1922, and a German mathematician Felix Klein, who we've already mentioned before in the context of hyperbolic uh, geometry, and his uh, Dates are 1849 to 1925. In addition, a friend of his, Sophus Lee, who was a Norwegian mathematician, 1842 to 1899. So the lives of Felix Klein and Sophus Lee were interestingly intertwined, and they were uh, friends and uh, sort of almost collaborators. Uh, but they sort of had a little bit of a falling out uh, later on in their career. There's a little bit of perhaps tension uh, between them. Nevertheless, the story of the development of the theory of groups and the connections with uh, geometries was really driven largely by, by those two uh, re remarkable mathematicians. So uh, on the algebraic side, I remind you that when we were talking about uh, Galois theory, the notion of a normal subgroup was very important. So a uh, normal subgroup, and I'll just remind you what that means. So suppose you have a, a subgroup H inside G. So this is usually the notation we use for H being a normal subgroup of G. What that means is that, so H is sitting inside G, it's a subset first of all, and it's a subgroup. And uh, so it's closed under the operations of, uh, of multiplication and inverse. But the normal uh, adjective corresponds to the fact that if you take uh, H and you multiply it as a sort of a set by any element G on the left, say, or maybe G inverse on the left and G on the right, okay, that, that, you, that you get back the same set H. So this is sometimes called conjugation, this action when you multiply by an element on the right and, the, and its inverse on the left. Of course, it doesn't amount to anything in the commutative setting. In the commutative setting, it's just nothing. But in a non-commutative setting, this is some kind of important operation. And so a, a subgroup is normal if it's invariant under conjugation. That's another way of saying it. Okay, and so normal subgroups appeared in the, the question of Galois, of asking when can we decide uh, if a, you know, an equation has... Uh, uh, solution by radicals. But uh, there was also, as group theory developed, the normal subgroup was kind of a, uh, a tool for trying to understand groups by building them up from smaller groups. All right. So if uh, H is a normal subgroup of G, then it turns out that in some sense you can factor out G by H. You could, there's a, a way of sort of dividing G by H, and this is also a group. 
Okay, we won't define what this is. This is called a quotient operation. But all you have to know is that if you have a normal subgroup, then you can essentially divide the big group by the smaller group, and you get another group. Right? And, that way, and then that way, we can somehow reduce the study of G. So the study of some group G is reduced to the study of this particular subgroup H and this sort of quotient G mod H. So it's a way of somehow uh, trying to simplify the study of larger groups. Now when you're doing this, a natural uh, sort of end result is that you have a, a group G which doesn't have any normal subgroups. If a group doesn't have any normal subgroups, then this is not, you're not going to be able to make this kind of reduction. So if G has no normal subgroups, well, other than the identity and G itself, which are always normal subgroups, then we say that G is simple. G is a simple group. Okay. Now that does not mean that the study of such groups is simple. It turned out to be highly non-simple, non but uh, nevertheless this is a, a nice definition and this picks out then some kind of group that are somehow atomic in some sense. And so a natural uh, question in the classification of groups is, can we sort of find or list all simple groups? Question, what are all, say, the finite simple groups? That turned out to be a very influential and important question, which in fact drove a lot of mathematical development in the 20th century uh, as well. But there was a kind of another side of this. Okay, so in the 19th century, uh, we had uh, a further development, is that uh, group theory, group theory sort of split in, in essentially three different directions. So one was in terms of finite groups. And then another one was infinite discrete groups. And third is continuous uh, groups, which are also more or less uh, the same as uh, Lie groups. All right, so a proper introduction to Lie groups would take quite a lot of time and so quite a technical uh, subject. So I'm going to uh, be a little bit uh, cavalier about uh, details, and I might not say things which are entirely uh, true in the, in the, in the interests of, of brevity. So what I want to do is I want to uh, show you some, some, some of the rich groups that uh, people discovered. But I want to actually do it in terms of uh, the actual underlying objects that people studied. So when you have uh, an object, say like this, you can ask for its symmetries. And that turns out to be a group in general. And abstractly, if you have some abstract group, you can kind of ask, well, are there some objects for which it's the group of symmetries? So there's a kind of a duality here between objects, which are physical or mathematical things, and groups of symmetries. In some sense, this is rather concrete, while these groups of symmetries are algebraic and a little bit more abstract. But the 19th century people started to realize that it's really powerful to think about the correspondence between these two things. And this was especially championed by, by Lee. But I want to show you the, the groups by uh, drawing diagrams and looking at patterns and looking at the symmetries of patterns. Okay, so. We're going to be interested in lots of examples of groups appearing in, in mathematics uh, that was developed in this late 19th century. So first of all, I, I should probably say that there are two main groups. There are two main, maybe we should say families, 
or types. Okay, and the first family is the, the symmetric group. So SN is the symmetric group, which we already talked about. That is your all-embracing finite group. And every finite group is inside one of these symmetric groups for some n. So famous theorem of Cayley is that every finite group, G, is, uh, is a subgroup of uh, Sn for some n. And then the other important family is the family of GLN. Okay, what, are G, what is GLN? GLN is those matrices. We're talking about uh, M, an N by N matrix. All right, with entries in some field. Okay, the field is a little bit arbitrary, but the most natural thing is to choose with entries in the rational numbers, or Q. So these are n by n matrices with entries in the rational numbers, or Q, which happen to be invertible. In other words, which have inverses. And that's the same thing as saying that their determinants are non-zero. So you may remember, I hope, from linear algebra that the determinant of the product of two matrices, m times n, is equal to the determinant of m times the determinant of n. And so if m and n are invertible, the determinants are non-zero, then it follows that the determinant of the product is also non-zero, and so the product is also invertible. That means when you multiply two invertible matrices, you get another invertible matrix. And the inverse of the invertible matrix obviously exists, and so that's a group. It's a group of matrices. Okay. And in some sense, this is sort of the big, this is a sort of a continuous family of, of matrices, because it's not just a finite set. Right? There's infinitely many n by n matrices if you allow entries to be any rational numbers and so uh, this is a really a, a Lie group, and this is a finite group. Okay, so we have a, two kinds of examples here, finite groups and the continuous groups. Okay, so we're going to see uh, some examples of, of both kinds of, uh, of groups in the, in the next couple of examples. So let's have a look at planar, planar objects with symmetry. Okay, so the most simple kind of object with symmetry is a regular polygon. Let's say a pentagon, for the sake of illustration, okay, with equal sides and angles. Okay. So this is obviously some kind of symmetrical uh, thing because there's, uh, there's various symmetries. But uh, it's actually, there's actually sort of two different ways of thinking about this at least. So the simpler way is actually if we put arrows on uh, the, the sides to begin with, so that it's uh, directed. So a regular polygon we might say directed. In that case, the symmetries are just rotations. In other words, if we ask what kind of transformations can we do to this thing, to move it around so that it goes back to the same position it was before, then the answer is basically given by powers of a rotation. Okay? There's a rotation, the group of symmetries is uh, generated by a single rotation, oh, let's call it rho, where rho is a rotation of one-fifth of a turn. And so rho to the fifth equals the identity. 
This is an example of a cyclic group, sometimes called Z5. And so its elements are E, rho, rho squared, rho cubed, and rho to the fourth. And with the relation that rho to the fifth equals E, that shows you how to multiply any two of them. Now, a very closely related example is what happens if we remove the arrows. If we remove the arrows, we get uh, just a regular polygon. And now there are uh, more symmetries. There's the rotation row that we had before. But there's also uh, reflection. For example, uh, the reflection in this line here. Okay. Let's call that a reflection, say, uh, a sigma. All right. So in this case, the group of symmetries is generated by rho and sigma, and has altogether uh, 10 elements in this case, consisting of essentially the five rotations. And there are actually five possible different reflections, uh, one through every vertex in the center. In terms of relations, these uh, elements can be defined by the relations of r to the fifth equals one, because it's a rotation, one-fifth of a turn. And then uh, sigma squared equals the identity, because if you do it twice, you get back to where you started. Maybe I should write e to be consistent with what I did before, e. <coughs> and uh, sigma rho sigma equals sigma inverse. This is a more interesting relation that's t saying that uh, if you take an element, uh, say this one here, A, and let's say you first uh, reflect it, so you would get uh, A prime up there, and then you rotate it, so that would give you uh, A double prime there, and then you reflect it again, the end result is to rotate by a, quarter, a fifth of a turn in the negative direction, rho inverse. And you can uh, test that that works not just for that particular vertex, but for any of the vertices. That's an arithmetical relation inside this group of symmetries. And this group actually has a name. It's called, uh, it's called the dihedral group. And uh, there's one for any uh, five we can replace with n easily enough. And it's interesting because it's a, quite different from the cyclic group in that it's non-commutative. So the, perhaps the first example from geometry of a non-commutative group where you just have a reflections and rotations and you get something non-commutative. Okay, so... Uh, then after this, a natural, somewhat more complicated uh, pattern to look at is tessellations of the plane. And we're going to be looking at very regular tessellations. So the question is, how can you tile the plane with regular polygons? Well, you only have one tile to uh, tile your bathroom floor, and it's got to be a regular polygon and you've got to tile your floor in such a way that you could extend it indefinitely. Well, there's only three ways of doing that, it turns out. One is to use square tiles. All right, that's, that's a square tiling, and that's sometimes given the symbol 4, 4. So I'll explain in a second why. And then there's a tiling by equilateral triangles. supposed to be equilateral triangles. <coughs> equilateral triangles, upside down and right side up. 
and they will tessellate the plane. And the basic objects there are triangles, and uh, that's what the three refers to. And the six refers to the fact that at any vertex, three of them meet. So over here, the basic objects are squares with four sides, and at any vertex, four of them meet. And then there's, of course, one more, which is uh, one created by regular hexagons. It's actually um, sort of contained inside here. If you look at just this part of this one here, you see a, a hexagon. So you think of that as a tile, then you could extend that hexagonal pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six. A kind of a honeycomb thing, so bees have discovered this. Okay. So you can carry on tiling the plane with these hexagons. And so here the, the Schlafly symbol, that's what this is called, is 6-3, meaning that uh, the basic objects are hexagons with three sides, and at any one vertex, three of them meet. And from this, you can see that there's a kind of a duality between these two. If you flip these two around, you get this one. And that corresponds to the duality in the diagrams. That if you took, uh, say, this one here, and you put a, a capital city in the middle of any one face, and then you joined up neighboring ones, well, then you're going to get that pattern. And if you do the same thing for that pattern, you will find that you get this one here. All right, so these are the only regular tessellations of the plane. And actually, I don't really know who first actually enunciated that. It's probably known to the ancient Greeks, but I'm not sure who actually stated this uh, first. But it would have been no, well known to uh, you know, Islamic architects and people doing designs, maybe even back to the Egyptians. Um, because whenever people were doing designs, making patterns with cloth or, or figures, the need for symmetry or the desire for symmetry was obvious, and so these patterns have occurred many, many times uh, throughout history in various ways. Um, yeah? Well, how do you do like a brick pattern? Because like, um, does, does it have to be like straight lines? Everything has to be straight lines or something? Okay, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So why, why, why don't, aren't we going to allow um, something like this, for example? So this, yes, this is also a, a tessellation. Well, what's the requirement that we want to, to make this one um, the main one? I guess the, the, the requirement is that adjacent uh, edges are, you know, that, that we have edges in the, in the situation. The edges are shared by adjacent polygons. That any one edge, like this one here, is actually an edge of both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So there's, there are many other tessellations. It's a very good question. There are many other tessellations which are kind of regular. Okay? These are sort of the most regular ones, the ones with the maximal amount of symmetry. But there are all kinds of other tessellations with all kinds of other shapes, but they don't have uh, this sort of strong property of edges being uh, well-defined between two uh, adjacent faces. Of course, there's this then uh, the corresponding story for the sphere, which is also a uh, two-dimensional situation. So regular tessellations of a sphere, where again we mean the same kind of thing that we want to subdivide it into polygons, which are all Uh, regular and such that any two of them uh, which are touching uh, share at edges. And there we just get the uh, platonic solids, which of course go back to the ancient Greeks. And I might just write them down. So there's the tetrahedron, which is which has Schlafly symbol 3-3. Three, three. OK, 
Okay, meaning that its basic <coughs> tile is a triangle, and at any one vertex, three of them meet. And then there's a cube, which has a basic shape, which is a, uh, a square. And at any one vertex, three of them meet. And there's the octahedron, which is made out of triangles. And at every triangle, at every vertex, four of them meet. And then there's the dodecahedron, or maybe icosahedron, which is made out of triangles. And at any one vertex, five of them meet. And then there's the dodecahedron, pardon me for using abbreviations, dodecahedron, which is made out of pentagons, and at any one vertex, three of them meet. All right, so these, are, these things here, we talked about them before, they're ca called the Schlafly symbols. Very uh, nice notation to describe these patterns, named after Ludwig Schlafly, who was a prominent 19th century Swiss mathematician, great geometer. So maybe in this corner here, I can squeeze in the tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. Regular, also regular, tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. So in the 19th century, we had the development of hyperbolic geometry, and Klein was very interested in this. And, okay, without going into a lot of details, one model of the hyperbolic plane is in terms of a disk, and then you have the situation where as you go to the boundary, the things don't look... Um, Things don't look quite so regular. It's hard to, hard to draw this way unless you do uh, it rather carefully. But what happens is that the various tiles, they're all pentagons, but they're, and they're all regular pentagons in the hyperbolic geometry sense, but they kind of get smaller and smaller as you approach this uh, boundary, which is sort of uh, at infinity. This is not a very good uh, diagram. Uh, it should be a, a lot prettier than that. Um, uh, so one has, actually, probably one shouldn't have three, that's what my problem is. I shouldn't have three meeting inside, I should have four meeting. One, two, three, four. That's, that's more sensible. Okay, something like this. And so there's one, one, two, three, four, five, four, five, and then there's another one, something like this. Okay, so here would be an example of something made out of pentagons where four of them meet at any vertex. Okay, so this is a very big subject, uh, and it generated a lot of interest in the late 19th century for two reasons. First of all, because uh, it was much richer than the story for the sphere or the plane. It turns out that there are a lot of tessellations, regular tessellations of the hyperbolic plane. And secondly, if you view this, say, as the unit disk in the complex numbers, then complex analysis and these tessellations are sort of naturally connected via theory of certain kinds of uh, functions, let's say. Modular kind of functions. So what makes the uh, theory richness is a certain e equation here that uh, determines the, the type, whether we're talking about planar, spherical, or hyperbolic. So if we have something of type uh, NK, made out of regular n-gons with k meet at, uh, at a vertex, then this situation here is 1 over n plus 1 over k equals uh, 1 half. Right, if you take one quarter plus one quarter, you get a half. If you take one third plus one sixth, you get a half. And these situations are all the situations where one over n plus one over k is bigger than a half. These are the only natural numbers that you can write down such that one over n plus one over k is bigger than a half. It's a small list. 
And over here, the regular tessellations are given by the equation 1 over n plus 1 over k is less than a half. Whenever you have this equation satisfied, there is a regular tessellation. And because n and k, if you just choose a random n and a random k, these are very small numbers, so yes, they'll be less than a half most of the time. So that means it shows you why there's so many such uh, tessellations in the hyperbolic plane, while this condition here is, and this one here is much more restrictive. So the 19th century geometers started to see that there was some kind of continuity between the hyperbolic geometry and the planar geometry and the spherical geometry with the, with the planar geometry sort of in between the hyperbolic and the spherical one. And that's visible just at the level of tessellations. Okay, so a natural question uh, that people started thinking about in the 19th century also was what about higher dimensions? In particular, are there higher dimensional analogs of the platonic solids? higher dimensional, say, platonic solids, analogs of platonic solids. Or we might say regular polyhedra. All right, so one has to say what exactly that means. But it turns out that you know, the situation was completely understood by uh, Ludwig Schleifli. Whose dates are 1814 to 1895. And a very beautiful work. He realized that uh, some aspects of the platonic solids extended in all dimensions. So the tetrahedron and the cube and the octahedron, they extend in all, for uh, extend to all higher dimensions. There's an obvious analog of a tetrahedron and uh, a cube and an octahedron. But in terms of the other ones, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, there are analogs of those only in dimension four. So analogs of the dodecahedron and the icosahedron uh, only in dimension four. And they are remarkable objects called uh, the 120 cell and the 600 cell. And the 600 cell has uh, 600 uh, cells uh, they're all like um, tetrahedrons. Uh, 1,200 faces, 720 edges, and 120 vertices. And this one here is, is dual uh, to this one. So if you revert, um, interchange those numbers, you get their numbers. And then there's something else called the 24 cell, which has uh, 24 uh, cells and 96 faces, 96 edges, and 24 uh, vertices. And this is a complete list, then, of all the regular polytopes in all dimensions. So this, these three, which are analogs of the icosahedron and dodecahedron, and this one here, uh, they only exist in dimension four. And then in dimension five, six, seven, and eight, and higher, there are really only relatively obvious extensions of the tetrahedron, cube, and octahedron. There's, in some sense, nothing really interesting 
in this direction in those higher dimensions. But in dimensions four and in dimensions three, th interesting things are happening in the sense of the existence of these highly symmetrical objects. And so the 19th century people realized that these were symmetrical. They were, may not be so easy to uh, visualize, but they had lots of symmetry and you could study their symmetry groups just as you could study the symmetries of the platonic solids, which we've already talked about. All right, so another interesting uh, kind of symmetrical patterns that people were interested in are um, generalizations of tessellations. They're really uh, more to do with patterns that occur in, well, in weaving, in art, uh, in architecture. And so these turn out to be of sort of a one-dimensional kind. They're, in this case, they're called freeze patterns or freeze groups. And there are uh, seven of them. And then in the two-dimensional situation, they're called wallpaper groups. And there are 17 of them. And in three dimensions, they're called crystallographic groups. And there's, well, it depends a little bit how you count them. Uh, but let's say there's uh, 230 of them. These are also sometimes called Federov uh, groups because of a mathematician who classified them in 1892. So we're touching base here with uh, art, weaving, but actually also with chemistry. So these crystallographic groups turned out to be very important and very interesting for chemists. All right, so what are we talking about here? So I can't give you a, an overview uh, of the whole story. Let's, let me say a little bit about the freeze groups. I can describe what they are. So the pattern is you have a, basically a strip okay, in which you're making a pattern. And you're interested in, in, a, in a pattern which has some symmetry, which re repeats, but which also might have some other kinds of symmetries. So uh, let me, so you know, Maybe you have a pattern like this or something. All right, that might be a certain kind of pattern. It has a certain kind of symmetry. So it has a translational symmetry, but it also has a rotational symmetry. If you take uh, the thing there and you rotate it uh, by 180 degrees, it has a symmetry in that direction. On the other hand, if I sort of made a, a little blob there, then that symmetry would, would be broken. It would no longer have that a rotational symmetry about there. Okay, so one can simplify these groups by sort of making simplified diagrams. So here are the seven freeze groups. There's one pattern. Here's another pattern. Here's another one. Here's another one. And here's another one. And maybe we'll go over here. Over here we have this one. And, and this one. So for example, uh, this one here, besides having translational symmetry, clearly if I sort of move it over, it moves to itself. But it also has what's called a glide reflection. Namely, if I look at the, the pattern, imagine like being on a tape like this, if I translate it and turn it over, okay, I don't go the full way, but I just go halfway, but turn it over at the same time, then this will map to this, and this will map to this, and the whole pattern will be mapped to itself. And uh, so you can study these various things. It's, uh, these are supposed to be at angles here, they're supposed to be. Maybe that doesn't look so clear. They're all supposed to be at angles. All right, so these are the seven freeze groups, and then there are, in the plane, 17 wallpaper groups. These are patterns that have a two-dimensional aspect, so in other words, that you can make a repeating wallpaper pattern out of. That would have some, uh, some patterns, so for example, um, 
let's say we, we had that kind of symmetry and, uh, and around here we have, um, I don't know, um, that may be shaded like this and then here we have something shaded like this and here we have something shaded like this and here we have something shaded like uh, maybe this. Okay, some, some pattern like this, which would have a certain kind of translational symmetry, but also be symmetric under certain kinds of rotations and certain kinds of reflections. And so the 19th century people were very interested in these things. They classified them. This was quite an extensive, important work. And more and more this idea uh, grew that when we're studying an object which has, which has symmetry, we should ask the question, what's the group of symmetries? It's always a natural question to ask, what is the group of symmetries? All right, so as people started developing this subject, they started becoming interested in finite groups for their own sake. And naturally, they started asking, you know, what are all the finite simple groups? This is a very natural question. And it turned out to be a very, very difficult and very profound uh, situation. That was, in fact, only resolved a few decades ago. And in fact, the story of explaining this uh, classification is still uh, underway. So early on, it was realized that the alternating groups, so AN, these are the alternating groups, inside the symmetric group. And I remind you, these are the permutations which are even, um, meaning that they're made of an even, so, well, maybe that de their determinant uh, is, a, say, plus one. If I write them out as a matrix, that's the easiest way of saying it. So for example, A3 is uh, E and then 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2 inside the full symmetric group of six permutations. Okay, and so the fact is that A sub n for n bigger than or equal to 5 is a simple non commutative. group. In terms of uh, commutative groups, the story is relatively simple. We're just talking about cyclic groups of, of prime order. So it was more interesting what are the non-commutative uh, simple groups. And this is the first sort of infinite family of, of simple groups. And then the uh, next family came from the uh, projective geometry. So in projective geometry, we are working with uh, homogeneous coordinates. So we, for example, if we're looking at just the projective line, sometimes called P1, this consists of um, pairs X, Y. We're talking about uh, ratios of things. And we can think about that projective line as just the space of all lines through the origin. That's a picture of the projective line. All right, so when people looked at symmetries of the projective line or projective geometry more generally, they realized that linear algebra had a lot to do with it. And at the 19th, end of the 19th century, linear algebra was starting to be developed in a sort of a more modern uh, way. And so uh, people realized that you could uh, send x, y to uh, ax plus by over cx plus uh, dy uh, to 1. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll write it uh, projectively. Uh, if we send it to ax plus by 
over to cx plus dy. So this transformation is a, a transformation of the a projective line. And it's associated to this matrix A, say, B, C, D. Where the matrix is given up to a scalar. So maybe we'll put up the scalar by putting uh, brackets. All right, if you mod out by the y or set y equal to, uh, to 1, we can sometimes also think of this as being just a function, as a rational function of the form ax plus b over cx plus d. This is a sort of equivalent, one more real-valued uh, version of that kind of transformation. And then what, uh, what happens is that this group of projective transformations is the group of symmetries of this projective line. And that had the name PGL2. So this is sort of the projective uh, linear group, where it's basically equal to a GL2, two by two matrices, up to scalars, where we're allowed to multiply by scalars and not change things projective general linear group. Okay, and the entries here are rational numbers or maybe real numbers if you believe in them, but it's best to think in terms of rational numbers. And people start to realize that you could replace the rational numbers with finite fields that Galois had introduced. So Galois had introduced finite fields. For example, the field f sub p of integers mod p, where arithmetic is mod p. And so what you can do is you can consider matrices, two by two matrices, with integers with not just rational in entries, but with entries from a finite field. So we can create groups, say P, G, L, 2, P, whose entries are from F, P, not rational numbers. In this way, we get finite groups. Okay, because there's only a finite number of uh, entries. There's only four possible places where those entries can go, so it's clear that you have a finite group. And this is a way of creating finite groups. And so the fact was that um, such, groups are, such groups are simple. Or P is a prime. And we got an interesting family, sort of another inter interesting family of um, finite groups. Okay, and then the story was compounded or made more curious by a remarkable discovery made in the 1860s by mat a mathematician called Mathieu. And so these are now called the Mathieu groups. So he discovered that there were, well, he discovered five new groups, five new simple groups. <coughs> and they are, uh, their names are M12, M11, M12, M22, M23, and M24. And these were subgroups of uh, permutations, of the permutation groups. They were, let's say, large subgroups of the permutation groups of the same uh, size. So for example, M11 was a subgroup of S11. So you have 11 things, and you have the group of all 11 factorial permutations. 
Inside there, there is a special group, which is actually a subgroup, but still relatively large. And it permutes the elements around in a quite a remarkable way. So uh, these, these uh, were rather mysterious kinds of groups. And, uh, but it, it turned out uh, that they ended up playing a, a major role in the 20th century and still, still are um, important uh, in the 20th century. So we'll take a break and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more about, about these groups and, and 20th century connections. And then we'll talk about the continuous groups of uh, Sophus Lee.